Y'all ready for the word? Are you sure? It's a big day. We've got baptisms. But even on top of that, you know what the next two weeks are? The end of the book of John. It's been a year and a half. Isn't that cool? In the book of John for a year and a half, the next two weeks are the final chapter. We're in um, John 21. And I, I had kind of created this series because I was looking at John 21 and it really deals with Jesus reconciling Peter's love for him. And when we first started the book of John a year and a half ago, we had this series called, Oh, for the Love of God. Because the whole, one, the major theme of John is God's love. In fact, he'll continue to write into 1 John about how God, what God's love is, what it's like, how God loves us, what he's calling us to in love. And it's this major theme, and we get to the end, and that's exactly how it opens is how it closes. And so we're going to be doing a series called Summer Love. We're going to do some skits with Greece. No, I'm just kidding. You know I don't do that stuff. Um, but it's going to be looking at like this fundamental concept in the Bible. I'm going to try to not make it cheesy or shallow because there's so much that the Bible says about it that we need to cover what is love. And it's something that's very confused in our culture. So when we get to this portion of, the, of John 21, what we're dealing with is Peter who has loved God. He's walked with Jesus. He's been excited to be a disciple of his. And then one day, he just flips out, he gets scared, and he rejects God, he denies him. And then Jesus dies, and he resurrects, and in John 21, we see him gather his disciples in his post-resurrection body, gathers them together, and he sits them down, and he looks at Peter, and he says, do you love me? And that's what we're going to look at today. So if you'll stand for the reading of God's word, we are in John 21, verse 15. It's a very short read today. And here's what it says. Jesus is sitting there eating with his disciples, bringing them together once again after they've run away in this terrible time. And he says, when they finish eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt. Because Jesus asked him the third time, why does he keep asking, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, then feed my sheep. Do what I'm saying. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. That's a, that's a big question, isn't it? That's a question we ask throughout our lives. You ask it to people you fall in love with. Do you love me? You ask it to your children. Do you, do you love me? You ask it to your friends that are like your besties. Do you, do you really love me? You ask it to the church when you're a pastor. Do you love me? Like it's the question of our lives. And here Jesus is asking that question. And this this. Reading is so interesting because if you've been at church any given amount of time, you've probably heard this, and I would call it nearly a misnomer. It's something we teach that I don't know is necessarily true, but it's common, all right? And it's this. It's that there's these, all these different definitions of love. So in this passage alone, it said, Peter, uh, you know, the Bible is written in Greek, in this portion of the Bible, and... Um, Jesus looks at Peter and he says, do you agapeo, agape me? All right, do you love me? He uses this Greek word. And then Peter says, Lord, you know I phileo you. I, and he uses a different word. And then 
Jesus says it again, do you agape me? And you know I phileo you. And then Jesus is like, oh, okay, it's is getting hard, so I'm just going to change my word. Do you phileo me? And Peter's like, you know that I phileo you. And we always talk about this, and in church they go, oh, agape, that's this type of love. It's unconditional. It's godly, divine love. And then phileo, it's like a lower form of love. And it's like brotherly love, like Philadelphia. That's where you get that word from, the city of brotherly love. Okay? There's other words for love that the Bible doesn't ever use this word, but it's eros. That's in the Greek language. It's erotic, romantic love. The Bible never describes our love that way, by the way. But here's the thing. My point is this. We all nerd out on these things. And as pastors, we love to pretend like we speak Greek and go, do you know what that word means? And then we create these definitions and we try to make preaches on this. But most people who are scholars on the Bible will tell you this. The point is not the difference in the meaning. In fact, these are like synonyms. We make this big distinction. How do you define it here? Maybe this is different and we'll define it this way. And they'll say, you know, well, these are very interchangeable. Almost everything I read on this says they're interchangeable. Here's how you know. It tells us that God loves the Son with agape love, but then it says He also loves the Son with phileo love. And in the same senses, sometimes it'll be like He loved Him using one Greek word and He loved Him using another, the same, a different Greek word, but they're synonyms. There's a historical reason why they started using one over the other. But otherwise, that wasn't the intent, is to make these big defining distinctions. And sometimes I think we get so much into the definitions of words, we fail to step back and go, what's the point of this chapter? What is the point? We've nerded out on these words, but what's the point? And the point isn't for us to get into the, our own definitions of how we understand these different words. It's to go, does Peter actually love God? That's the question he's asking three times. Do you really? How do you know? Do you really love me? Because based on what's just happened, you denied me three times when you said you loved me. I need you to think about this. How much do you really love me? See, everyone has a different definition, and that's what I think is my point. We get so caught up in what I mean. We get so caught up by, by what I mean love is. So if you have had any relationship, any type that you like, I really love this person, and you get into a conflict, and that conflict goes like this. They're not doing things that I like. I'm dealing with this right now. I got teenagers. They're not doing things I like. They're not showing me what I like. And I go, and they go, I love you. And I go, but do you? Anybody? Yeah, just me? Or a spouse or even a dear friend or even people in the church. I love you, Nick. And it usually is followed with but. Okay? And you go, you don't love me. Oh, I love you. No, you don't love me. And there's the conflict because why are we in, why do we have a difference of opinion? Because I define it differently than you define it. Whatever you mean by it is not what I mean by it. And that's the thing about it is we all have different definitions. Today's sermon is titled, What is Love? Baby, don't hurt me. actually not. But it is what is love. I want us to talk about that today from a biblical perspective. See, in culture, we have lots of different voices. There's nothing probably more written about in the history of the world than love. It is the most powerful emotion. I think we can all agree whether you hate it or you love it. Love is the most powerful emotion of all types. doesn't matter what type. Love causes something in us. It changes us. It drives us. One of my favorite, like, deepest, most beautiful movies is Moulin Rouge. <laughs> I like musicals. Shoot me. But, man, it's a love story. When it says, oh, love is a many splendid, splendid thing. Love lifts us up where we belong. All you need is love. And he starts singing, all you need is love. Quoting the, these are actually three love songs combined into one sentence. The Beatles, if you prefer that one. Right? He sings the praises of this woman he loves. Or you might read Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet. And it says, my bounty is as boundless as the sea. Love is as deep. 
The more I give to thee, the more I have, for both are infinite. And they espouse these things, this grandeur, this beauty of love, but right before they kill themselves because they love each other so much. Sorry if that's a spoiler. <laughs> but then I found this really interesting. Everybody remember, like, I don't know, 12 years ago, Brangelina? Remember those days, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, Hollywood's hot couple? Well, she was in Parade magazine, and she said this back then, and it's funny now in hindsight to read this, because we have seen a story play out over time. And she said this, I always wanted a great love affair. Love is something that feels big and full, really honest, and enough. No moment should feel slight. No moment should feel false or a little off. For me, it had to be everything. I feel sad for someone who has never known love. Brad knows me completely, exactly as I am. Every part of me, he loves me. The kids, they love me. They know all my flaws and all my oddities, and they accept them as they are, and so I can feel complete. Man, the odes of love, right? Like, I wish, she's so jealous. Uh, she wishes all of you could have what she has with Brad. <laughs> right? Half the women in the room, 10 years ago, you're like, I wish I could have that too with Brad. <laughs> and yet, 12 years, 13 years later, this ode to love has turned into separation and ugliness and abuse uh, being levied at people and separation of families and children. I wish people could have this love. Well, Angelina, we do. Because that's how we talk about it. Love is this splendid thing. Love lifts us up where we belong. All you need is love, and if you have it, you have everything. You're so complete. But what do you mean by it? I think sometimes there was a 19th century American poet named Ambrose Bierce, and he said... Love is a, temp is, a temporary, is a temporary insanity curable by marriage. See, he had a different definition. I feel a little more akin to that one. I'm just kidding. My wife told me not to tell that joke. <laughs> Love is a temporary insanity curable only by marriage. See, everybody's got a different definition of what love is. Or maybe yours is a lot more simple. This is maybe more of ours. I love lamp. <laughs> Do you really love lamp, Brick? I love basketball. Oh, how I love this or how I love that. We use it in all these shallow ways. And that's what's so crazy about the definition of love. On one end, it is the most enormous, godlike thing. It drives my life. Oh, all you need is love. This is what fulfills me. This is what completes me. And I love enchiladas. <laughs> what? See, that, and it's actually in our dictionaries this way. One is an intense feeling of deep affection. In fact, you feel it so deep, it's a romantic and sexual attachment. Or one is, I like or enjoy that very much. This is how we define love. But you know what they have in common is this, love is about the feelings others or other things provide for me. The feelings you provide for me or enchiladas provide for me. The desires you arouse in me that's what this love is. That's how we almost always some way eventually define it. Today I want to look at this. Why is love so conflictual? Why is there so much tension in our conversations about it? Why in society do we fight over it? Why in your relationships do you always get in tension about the, no, do you love me? Do you love me? You don't love me. Why is there so much conflict? Why is it so hard? And here's my aim is, to, I think it's because we lack a true definition of love. 
I think we come to it and don't have any definition of what it's actually supposed to be. We've watched it from others and we just said, well, whatever my parents or media or my society has said is love, I think that's what love is. And you have this amorphous view of what love should look like in your life. But really no definition. See, in our culture, there's this famous saying. And it's it's super, like, deep. It's, like, so philosophical. I don't know if you'll be able to handle it. It's this. Love is love. Amor es amor. Love is love. And it sounds pretty. It's just like, you should just know what it is. We all know what it is. You just instinctively know love is love. All love is the same. But the problem is, if you look at it, it's, a circu- it's what's called a circular definition. Because you go, okay, can you give me a defini- definition of what love is? And they go, well, it's love. And it sounds beautiful, but it has no meaning. And all that means is, whatever you think it is, is what it is. And that's why you're always in conflict. Let me tell you very clearly, I know this is nobody else's marriage, but Michelle's view of love and mine are very different. Hers needs me to say it. I'm like, but I paid attention to you. That's love. There's a conflict. Right? And that, I think, is what we need to look at is when it's left up to us to define what that is, that's why there's so much contradiction, so much difference. And so where do we get a definition? I want to look at the life of Peter. Because I think Peter's life kind of looks at this for us. He says, okay, he's sitting around the table right before Jesus' crucifixion. They're doing the Last Supper, right? And in the Last Supper, he, he, Jesus tells them, all of you are going to desert me. At some point, you're all going to leave me. And Jesus, like, and Peter, like, like Shakespeare, sings this almost poetic response of this ode to his great love for Jesus, he goes, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. And he he proclaims his unabated love of God to Christ. And then in the same chapter in Matthew 26, Jesus gets arrested. Now everything's changed. See, up to this point, Peter's been dating Here's what I mean. Peter met him and he was like, come away with me from your job. I'm going to give you a beautiful life. Peter's like, this is awesome. And he's like, see those 5,000 hungry people? You and I are going to feed them together. Oh, this is amazing. We're going to walk on water together. This is powerful. It's like, we're going to heal the blind and raise the dead. Oh my gosh, all the feels. And then society changed. Everybody began to hate Jesus. And now death was on the table. Life was about to get less exciting. He got married. See, it was all exciting. And now he's like, are you committed to me? You see the difference? And as soon as it got to commitment, are you willing to walk through pain and suffering and commitment with Christ who's about to die for you in love? You know what Peter did? It says this. He rejects him, and you know that, but there was the one little line that stood out to me. While Jesus was being taken away, it said that Peter followed at a distance. He distanced himself. It's like, I'm not with him. He watched, but he began to distance himself because it was about to get hard. It was about to make him less comfortable, less excited. The feelings were going away. And it says this, is that he followed him at a distance and eventually three people ask him, are you with him? Do you know him? Do you love him? And then he goes, I don't even know him. I don't even know him. What are you asking me? And I think that's something you got to wrestle with. This is how you start to lose love. He followed at a distance. He distanced himself until he got to a place where he's like, I don't really feel that anymore. I don't really know him. I'm not with that. 
See, our love is often like this. I'm passionately going with someone, a long life, singing their praises, singing their songs. But then times change. Feelings change. It no longer is serving me well. And so we change. I don't know, I just fell out of love. We grew, we, we grew out of distance. There's been a distance between us. See, here's the thing. It, it's not that Peter's a bad guy. Peter is all of us. Peter really believed he loved Jesus. He really meant his ode to love. He really was like, no, I would never hurt you that way. I would never desert you. I would never be unfaithful to you. He really meant it. But then his comfort and his fear and his need for safety became more important. See, Peter desire, desired to have more, a more comfortable life over time overcame his commitment to Christ. Peter's desire to have a more comfortable life overcame his commitment to Christ. He did love God. He did love Jesus. He had great affection for him. But also, he loved his safety, his security. And he began to say, I'm not with him. See, Jesus was on the way to the cross. Peter knew this. He had heard Jesus explaining, do you want to know the love of God? I'm going to die for you. Greater love has none other than this, than one man lays down his life for his friends. And friends, I'm going to lay down my life for you. Jesus taught this to him. I love you that much. God loves you that much. Peter knew about how much Jesus was about to die for him because he loved him. And Peter was like, I love you until it gets hard, and then I'm backing off. Now, I don't think any of us would say those two are the same type of love. Is love love? Would you say that's the same type of love? Okay, so we have a distinction of definitions. Love is not love. That is not the same. There's a difference. So where then do we get a definition of love? How do we begin to define it since it's so powerful and yet nondescript? Since we mean it in so many different ways. Where do we begin? From the, the premise of love in Scripture is this. This is what we hear, how we begin defining love according to Scripture. God is God. It has to start there. What does that mean? It's not meant to be a circular definition. Here's what that means. That God represents that which is highest, that which is greatest, that which is most important. God is God. He is the defining person of my life. That's what that means. He is the defining person of my life. There's the two greatest commandments in the Bible are this, and you probably have heard them and you probably know them. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The entire Bible, the entire law is summed up in these two things. But oftentimes you don't know what comes before that. It's called the Shema, it says, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. It was a way of declaring God is top above all things. He is the first, he is the last, he is everything. And under God, I am to give and love him above all other things with all my heart, soul, body, mind, strength, work, okay? And in so doing, I also am to love my neighbor as myself. But it says, God is God. God is number one. He's the one who defines what is true for me. He's the one who defines what is work for me and what I should do and what my purpose is. He's the one who defines what is love for me. That's what it means. It's a commitment to say, you get to tell me what is most important. You get to tell me how I should live my life. That's what I mean by God is God. That's the pres presumption of the scriptures. That God would be above all things. And he defines your life. You don't define it. Because he created you, and he loved you, and he died for you. Number two, then, if God is God, the Bible says this. It says, and it is from the Bible, even though everybody uses it all over the world for different meanings, he says, God is love. Now, that's sweet. God is love. It's very flowery. But what does that mean? It means his acts of love define how I am to live. 
the way God loves, how, what he does, what he says, how he acts in Jesus Christ begins to define how I am supposed to love people. So I begin to look at his life and go, does the way I love people reflect the way God and Christ has loved me and others? So God is God. If God is God, I start to look at his life and then go, am I loving? Am I seeking love? Am I giving love? And am I expecting love the way God has loved me? Am I holding people to the right standard of that? Now that's the premise of Scripture. However, if we look at the premise of our society and the culture in which we live, the premise of love in society does not start with these presuppositions. It first, is, first starts with this presupposition. God is not God. Okay? Now remember what that means. It means he's not number one. Now, most of us in this room, and if you're not a Christian, great, I'm so glad you're here. A large proportion of us in this room are probably professed believers. That doesn't mean God is God in your life. It means you've said, I love God and I love that God loves me and I've given my life to him, theoretically. But for most of us, we know the struggle, including myself, of going, but I don't really have time for him. I, I really define myself by the things I feel, by the work that I do, by the amount of money I produce, by how good I am at things. Uh, I, I drive to develop a family. I drive to find love, and that's my chief aim. And so God is good, but God is not God. Now, even those who are not believers, they would say the same thing. I don't believe God defines things for me. Some of us just live it in fact. We might say the right words, but we don't live like it. Okay? Some of us just outright reject it in society. We just go, God's not God. Like, he doesn't define how I'm to live my life. I choose who I love, how I love, what I do, where I work, how, what I consider success. I define my life. Okay? So, already, that's the premise of society. God is not God. Here's the problem. As soon as God is not God... Then when we say God is love, well, God is not God, so God doesn't get to define love either. And it leaves it blank. We have to define love because there is no greater, perfect, truer person to say this is what love is. In the Bible, I'm going to tell you over and over again in, in verses, says God, love is and then defines it for us. We'll talk about that in a bit. But if God is not God, he doesn't get to define it. I get to define it. So we just fill it in. Love is love. And you know what that means? It means I get to tell you what I expect of love. I get to tell you what I think love to you should look like. I get to, get to define it based on how I feel about it. And see, this is where we've said, this is where the conflict resides. This is why we're always fighting. This is why we're always starving for attention. This is why we're always cheating. This is why we're always struggling to get love from those we are with or families, our children, our parents, because love is love to each and every person. We're defining it. But it's simply not true. Here's the reality. I don't think any of you actually believe that statement that all love is love. All forms of whatever you call love is love. Nobody believes that. I don't care if you're wildly liberally progressive conservative, I don't care what you are, nobody believes that statement. Let me tell you why. Have you ever known somebody in a relationship that's abusive? They're in a relationship, the relationship is abusive, and the person goes, I just got that angry because I love you. I'm sorry, it's just, you know why I get that way, it's because I love you, and nobody in this room would go, yeah, that's love. If you did, you're there's something else. That's not love. But that guy thinks it's love. How do you get to define for him that that's not love? Taking power to show them what's right. See, all of us know it's not. How many marriages? Many in here probably. You were together. You, you got to the altar. You sang the praises. All oh, forever I love you. Sickness and in health. 
But then they got ugly, they got mean, and you go, I just don't love you anymore. Or maybe everything was fine, it's just one day you woke up and you're like, I'm bored and having a crisis. I just fell out of love. One person loves them, the other's like, I fell out of love. Then the question is, did you really love me? If this was just based on shallow needs being met until those changed, did you really love me? See, nobody really believes that, lo that love is equal. That's not love. Worst of all, I really need to stay off of social media. That's a cesspool, isn't it? So let me tell you about one of the things I saw in that cesspool this week. It was wild. And I, I, you know, I love that we have such an eclectic group here. I know everybody's got different opinions on things. I love that. It's great. But let me tell you something. I'm about to tell you a story that's going to make your stomach crawl. I don't care how progressive you are. There was a mother on the news, like a normal news station, and she was describing all this uproar in her community that people were uncomfortable with because her son, her teenage son, just turned 18. And after a few months, she said, we just discovered after he turned 18 that we had a different type of love than just mother and son. She said, we found out we really, like they had an Eros love. We loved each other and we want to be together. And she said, well... My family struggled with it at first, but now they're starting to accept us. Well, not so much accept us, but they're, they're getting accustomed to it. And she's trying to explain why it makes sense. And all of you just made the sound I made. You know why? Because none of you actually believe love is love. Because technically... If God is not God, then that is not wrong. If God is not God and there is no morality, there's no reason you can't be perverse like that. It just does something to you here because you know it. But there's no rational reason why that's any different than anything else you do. See? We all love the floweriness of it, but there are limits to it that you don't believe that yourself. Because she thinks that's love. Her son thinks that's love. It's all legal. But you know. Yeah. See, this is why there's so much tension in our relationships, so much tension in our society, so many cultural distinctions. Because we all have different definitions. And because God is not God, we get to go, who are you to say my abusiveness is not love? Who are you to say my teenage son and I cannot be lovers? Who are you? Please don't clip that for YouTube. <laughs> I just heard it. See, this is what happens. Slowly, love is love becomes love is God. Love is love becomes love is God. What does that mean? It's you know the feeling of love, any type of it. Romantic, sure. Sexual, sure. But for your children, for your parents, like there's just something powerful and bonding and deep for your deepest friends, like Love is the most powerful. We know this even, even scientifically studied. Like it is the most powerful, overwhelming chemical reaction in our brain. And because of that, when love is love and God is not God, the things that I love, the people that I love, whatever it is, I love my work. I love feeling success. I love getting attention from women. Whatever it is, because of that, it's so overwhelming. It becomes my driving, defining course of my life. I will give my whole identity to the things I love. This is who I am. I put it on my car. I put it on Facebook. 
Like, this is what I love. This is who I am. And when the person that I love isn't loving me, you know what I got to do? I got two things. I either leave them because they can't love me the way I expect, which is way up here. They can't meet my definitions that are ever-changing of what I expect and love. Or I just keep just begging and, and berating them and putting them down. You're not loving me. Love me more. I'm getting clingy. And I, I need you to fill this gaping hole in my life because love is God. So you get overly controlling or you might get abusive or you might get unfaithful and abandon them because they aren't filling this void that God was meant to fill in your life. And it becomes wildly problematic because it controls your whole life. This is who I am. I, like Angelina Jolie, I am not complete until Brad fills this hole, until people accept me and never ask me to change and don't make my life harder. It's got to be everything, she said. Love has become God. And the problem is, is when God is not God and God is not your main love and love becomes God, love becomes the devil. As love becomes God, your love becomes bedeviled. The more you allow it to try to become this thing, it possesses you. Your love becomes bedeviled. What does that word mean? It means you're always in internal conflict. You're always struggling to get more of it. You're always struggling to be satisfied and find some contentment and to feel like you're enough and that you matter and that you want to do more for the other so that they love you more. You give more sex to more people just so that they will think you're worth it. And you're, you're chasing after these things with your whole life. Until one day, like Brangelina, you're sitting there going, I thought this was going to be everything. It was so beautiful. And now, gosh, it's terrorized us. Like it turned into abusiveness and dissension. It's all out in the social world. Like my life, my kids are distant. There's weird things going on with my children where they don't want to be around. Because love is God. And when love is God, love is the devil because it requires everything of you. Here's what C.S. Lewis says in his book on the four loves. He says, if we ignore the truth that God is love, it may slightly come to mean for us the converse, that love is God. Every human love at its height has a tendency to claim for itself a divine authority. Its voice tends to sound as if it were the will of God himself. It tells us not to count the cost. It demands of us a total commitment. It attempts to override all other claims and insinuates that any action which is sincerely done for love's sake is thereby lawful and even meritorious. That erotic love and love of one's country must thus attempt to become God's. He's saying it's a totalitarian call on your life like it is God. It says, give me everything of yourself. And have nothing required of you outside of Anything that's required of you outside of this, give that away. Sacrifice that because this is your pursuit. This is where you'll find salvation for your soul. That's what you're after. I want salvation for my soul. And he says, when all of this happens, it becomes like God. This is who I am. This is my identity. This is what I strive for. This is what I complain about. This is what I talk about. These are the only people I hang out with who think like this. And I am going to chase it until I find it in its perfection. And it leaves you crushed. He says, even your love for your own country will lead to you to hating people and causing division and giving up your loved ones because you love your politics more than you love the people that love you. Because you love it so much, it becomes bedeviled. Every relationship becomes conflicted. Even your romantic love, you, you squeeze the life out of people and, and, and you berate them and mistreat them and you complain and you whine over and over because they're not giving you everything that you need. There was a <clears throat> Swiss philosopher named Denis de Rougemont and his quote is great. He says, love ceases to be a demon only when love ceases to be a God. 
Love ceases to be a demon. It ceases to act as the devil in your life only when you stop elevating it to the level of God and God is God. You put God as God, he's the one you put your attention to, your hope in, your salvation, your purpose in, and all of a sudden your love starts to make more sense in the context of relationships, but you put that first in, you will be bedeviled. But do you know what is scariest about this whole definition and breakdown? So if God is not God, then God is not love. If God is not love, then love is love. If love is love, then love becomes God because it's the most powerful thing in the world outside of God. Most powerful emotion. And as love becomes God, God becomes my definition of love and I start defining who God is. I can't tell you how many friends I've had over the years who express their love of God, the salvation of God, the grace of God in tears. And then one day, they got to parts of the Bible that they didn't like. And they said, no, not my God. My God would never tell me I can't do this if I like it. My God would never have consequences to sin. That's not loving. And they begin to redefine who God is. They didn't stop even believing necessarily. Some did, but a large proportion were like, I became spiritual and I realized God is love. But all they mean is I'm defining God based on how I define love. Do you see it? I get to tell God who he is based on what I like and what I think is the most loving based on how I feel about it. God is created in my own image of what love should be. See, God is not God, therefore God is not love. Love is God, and therefore God is defined as how I think love should look in my life and for others. It's dangerous because there is no higher standard of truth. There's no higher standard of calling. There's nothing that can call me to change or to love better or forgive better based on a higher standard than what I think. Everything's based on feelings. God is based on feelings. Love is based on feelings. And those feelings change. So goes my relationship to God and others. Your feelings at church change. I loved it when I was there, but now I'm not feeling it. So you distance. You follow at a distance. You know, I'm not with him. It's the same way you treat your relationships. Oh my gosh, that was so exciting. Things are changing. My feelings are changing. I'm a little, so I follow at a distance. It's how we treat God, it's how we treat others, because we are defining love by what I think it is and how I feel about it. So, here's a little weird tidbit about me. I started reading psychology when I was like 13, and one of my favorite authors I met, didn't meet him in person, I became aware of him at around 15, his name was M. Scott Peck. Now, I'm not telling you to go read his books, he's a little nutty. But he wrote this book called The Road Less Traveled. You've probably heard of that one. He wasn't a Christian when he wrote it, but it was still profound in my opinion. And I read, then read him for the rest of my life. I've been reading him every so often. And he wrote more. He became a Christian and wrote more about it. But again, he's a little nutty. So not exactly theologically orthodox. But what he taught on psychology and relationships have really affected me. In fact, it was really funny. My wife began reading one of his second or third books. And she was in the library one day with me, and she was like, every time this guy says something, it sounds like you. <laughs> and I go, well, that's we. I haven't read him in a while, but from a young age, the way he talked about relationships and love and death and mysteries and faith, like, it resonated. And so he says this. He, gives a, he had a section called the definition of love. And this one always stuck to me. And he said, commitment is the foundation, the bedrock of any genuinely loving relationship. It's it's commitment. Love is the commitment of the will to extend oneself beyond what you're comfortable for the purpose of nurturing your spiritual growth or another's spiritual growth. 
Okay? This is his definition of love as after he explains it in this chapter. He says it's a commitment. That's not sexy. You know, you, you don't fall in love and just be like, I had no feelings, but oh, the commitment. You don't hear that in poems or Taylor Swift songs. We are so committed. Every time he's a jerk, I'm still there. Right? Not sexy. But the definition of love, love is a commitment. It's a commitment of the will. What does that mean? It means he actually explains this. In spite of feelings, you choose to continue by action in a verb sense of the love to do what is necessary to seek the spiritual well-being of another You choose to continue to act upon commitment to serve another for their spiritual well-being, that this is love. Now, he's barely a Christian, but he's closer to the definition than anything we think in this society. And it got me to think about the cross of Christ, which becomes the definition. The cross of Christ is the direction and definition of true love. See, in our society, there's a circular notion of this. If you love me, I'll love you based on what I think is love, based on what you need to think is love, because we don't agree, and then we just keep going round and round fighting and having differences and going in and out of relationships and struggling and in conflict because we don't have a definition, and yet you go to the Scriptures, and it starts with two premises. God is God. And if I start with that premise, that means when I look at you in this audience, I go, Mark, you and I agree that God is God. That means whatever he says I am to do in this relationship with you, I am called to. Now, if I fail to love you because I'm being self-centered, I have a standard that goes, do you love him like Christ? And if you fail to love me, with the same type of love of Christ, we have a standard. So we have this horizontal friendship and relationship in which we both agree that there is a definition of love and you and I might not be meeting it. And we can change each other. And we can, give our, and we can challenge each other. And we can say, I'll change for you because I want your spiritual growth. Will you change for me? Because you want my spiritual growth? See, God is God is the horizontal relationships. If we agree upon that, we can begin to define love. And then we go to God is love. And now we see it fully in the cross of Christ. And there's a direction to it. It is not circular. There's a direction. It starts with God and flows down to us in the cross of Christ, through the life of Christ, through his death and resurrection. When God is God, it brings a definitive way of living in love. That's in your notes, I think, but not on my screen. When God is God, it brings a definitive way of living in love. It gives me a definition. It tells me how I'm supposed to be and love and act upon the world. It gives me an understanding of what I should expect of others with grace. What does 1 John tell us? It says this. We'll go back a little bit. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Read those first three words for me. Do it. Come on. Once more. Anybody need that in the Greek? Anybody confused what those words mean? It's a definition. Not this might be uh, love. It says this is love. God is love, it says in the Bible, and this is what love is. That one man who is God, Jesus Christ, 
though he had never sinned against us, committed his, himself to become and walk with us who do not love him. We are unfaithful to him. We do not appreciate him. While we were still sinners, he came down, entered into our life. He then said, Father, I don't want to go through this walk with you. Like, I don't want to go through suffering. I don't want to go to the cross. But if this is your will, it is my will. I will follow all the way to the cross because I love you and so that your love might be known to the world. So he walked and he gave, walked that road all the way to the cross so that he might die as an atoning sacrifice for your sins, though you did not love him yet. And so it says, since God, since it was already done, since he already loved you, since he already committed his will for your spiritual salvation, he hopes that your response to that would be like an ode of Shakespeare. Oh, that you have done this great love for us. Oh, that your love has been poured out upon me and your grace has been shown to me. I want to love one another and God the same. Because of how you've loved me, I want to love you. I want to give myself to you too. No guilt, no manipulation. I just, because of the way God has loved me first. This is love. And he says, if you watch me and the fact that I have committed my whole life to you, even when it was so hard I had to go through the crucifixion, and even though you didn't appreciate me and I didn't have, the, you think Jesus had the feels for you? You think he was up there just being like, I feel so good about them? No, he says, even when I failed to feel good about it, he committed himself to the cross for the atonement, the covering of your sins, the forgiveness of your sins. If God is God and God is love, then what is God's definition of love? I'm going to give you one today. Love is a commitment Love is a commitment of the will to share the love and grace of Christ even when it's hard. Even when I don't feel like it. Even when you spit upon me. You know, if you've ever loved someone dearly, it is so hard to go, this person doesn't love me back. Not the way I would like them to. Today, as I sat in prayer during worship, I've been feeling this a lot lately of like the ones I love do not love me with my definition of love. And yet the only way that that doesn't become all-consuming anger and frustration is to stand before Christ and go, I do not love you the way you have loved me. I do not give my full self to you. It's like we sang today. Like that song... Oh, if more of you means less of me, take everything. I just want to love you. It's such an ode. It's such a Shakespearean sonnet. Oh, if more of you means less of me, take it. I want nothing else. I just want you. And how I wish it were true, but it's not true. I want an easy life and I want to love God. I want to be happy as I define it, and I want to love God. I want to do what I want, and I want God to be happy about it. Love is a commitment. It says, I don't, whatever changes, when things get hard, when I don't feel it, when I'm not happy, see, we don't just go to church when we feel it. We go, it's a commitment to God. I just, you deserve it, even today as I don't feel it. And it's a commitment of the will. I don't care how I feel, I will. I will do it. And it's a commitment of the will to share the love and grace of Christ. Has God been gracious with you, church? Has he been eternally and fully committed and gracious to you? Has he loved you to the point of death? 
Has he suffered on account of your well-being and spiritual well-being? Are you saved because of his great love for you? Even when it's as hard as a walk to the cross, a death on a cross, he loves you that much. Will you go do the same for others to share his love and grace with others? Will you love those who are unlovable? Will you love your enemies? That's what he says. Will you love the person you fell out of love with, even when it's hard? Or will you distance because it got hard, like Peter? Will you stick to it? Will you be committed? Will you fight? Will you share for the grace and love of God to be seen? Will you be patient and and long-suffering? Because Christ was that way for you and me. How different is that definition than our circular form of love? Love is love. As long as you feel it, it is love. As long as you like it, it is love. Until you don't, of course. How different is this definition from the Bible? From, from the, this is love of Christ. At the end, you know, I'm closing here, and one of the things I get asked all the time, it's just a part of church you got to deal with, is about political stances, what I think about this, what our stance is on that. Uh, What's your stance on this cultural issue or on sexuality in the church or yada, yada? And you know what? It sounds like a cheap answer and it's not. I mean this with the bottom of my heart. I really don't care about your behaviors because even if you were morally perfect according to the Bible, if you could be, and God was not God of your life, then you are not doing what it calls you to. If you're being a good person, but God is third, fourth on your list of importance, you're not a good person according to the scriptures. My number one interest in this church, before all other things, is this statement, is God God? What does that mean? It can sound trite. What I mean is, and I'm going to tell you right now, it is not a yes from me. God is not God of my life all the time. Is God God? That's my number one interest. That's why I'm here. That's why I do what I do, because our calling is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your emotions, with all your passions and your soul, with all your strength, with your work, with your movement, with your actions, with your time, to love the Lord your God the way he has loved you. And at any place where you don't love him that much, he's calling you to love him to trust him, to say, God, you are God. Even if I don't like it, I will go. Even if I don't understand it, I will go. And then morally and behaviorally, things begin to change in my life. See, if God is God, then when I read the scriptures and he begins to defining what my purpose and truth and what goodness is, and I start to go, wow, there's parts of my life. There's parts of my life that are not godly. There's parts of my life that are self-centered, sexualized. There's parts of my life that are hateful. And now I'm not going, oh, I shouldn't be like this. I'm guilty. I go, the one who has loved me fully, I am not loving. See, there's a part we're going to talk about next week, right after this, where Peter is walking with Jesus and he goes, and what does he say in this passage, actually, that we just read today? He says, do you love me? And what does he say to him? He says, then feed my sheep. Now, what is he saying? Feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. What is he saying? Will you do and commit to do what I have asked you to do? One thing that we don't talk about enough, we just like God is love in these smushy little sermons, is what he says is, if you love me, you will do what I say. And that's going to be a conviction. Please come to church even though it's uncomfortable. Next week, that's what he says to Peter. If you love me, then do what I say. Act it out, live committed to it. Will you commit to discipling people and taking care of the church, even when it's hard? 
if you love me, do what I say. What is he saying? Is God God? Am I first? And what does he say to Peter? He says, the first question he says is, do you love me more than these? See, Peter said, I love you more than anyone, but he didn't love him more than his comfort or his safety or his security. He followed at a distance. He said, do you love me more than these? And friends, I'm going to put that question in your head. Is God God? Then do you love him more than your comfort or do you not have time for him? Do you love him and trust him in his word or are you going to give up on every relationship that gets hard for you? Are you going to leave everyone who's difficult and doesn't make you feel good? Are you going to divorce when the sex becomes less appealing? Is God God? Because what he's saying is, do you love me more than sex? Do you love me more than your money? Do you love me more than your work and your success and your comfort and your laziness? Do you love me more than staying at home? Do you love me more than never going to a community group? Do you love me to never get in your word? Do you love me more than your time? Do you love me more than your fun? Do you love me more than your work and your money? Do you love me more than these? And if you love me, go do what I say. Because love is a commitment. An act of the will to do what you said you would do in the grace and love of God, even when it's hard. Do you believe that? See, there is a definition of love. But I'll tell you, it's a hard definition, but I'll tell you, it's the one definition that won't leave you bedeviled and broken and wanting if you learn to love God first. All your other loves will become ordered. All your other love will find less pain and conflict, and less be you'll be less bedeviled when God is God. Right before, as we worship here today, I'm going to give you a challenge. Next week, we're going to be talking about what Jesus says when he says, if you love me, will you let me lead you where you do not want to go? Will you let me lead you where you do not want to go? Are you committed? Jesus gives some pretty clear commands in the Bible. There's a lot of things that I don't have answers to, but there are some clear ones. Number one is, if you love me, if God is God... He says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Friends, if you don't know Jesus like that and you're tired of broken love, of chasing love as a God, the loves of your life, the comforts of your life, if you know you've been following at a distance and going, I don't really know him, here's my challenge to you. Repent means to turn away from your current course to God. To repent of your sins, to say, I don't want these anymore. I want to love you more than these. If that is you today, we're doing baptisms. If you would like to be prayed for, to accept Jesus Christ, is there anybody here who would like to, that I could just pray for you as we close this service? That you would like to accept the love of Christ and make God God of your life. right. If that is still you and you would like prayer, we have a prayer team over here and we'll pray for you. But if you feel like you are ready to be baptized in front of a confession of faith in front of believers to say, I want to make God, God of my life, you can get baptized today. Just come see me over on the side. I will be here and I will baptize you as well. Because today is your day then. Secondly, the other command of Christ is to go and make disciples. And if you got my email this week, it's the thing we do worst as a church. We don't, as a church, and not just us, the capital C Church, we don't disciple people. We don't share the grace and love with faith and walk with people. But we are commanded to. Is God God, church? Is God God? Then go and do what he says. We're going to be 
haven't signed up for Rooted, this is the easiest way to go. I'm going to invite people who don't know the love of God, who I love that don't know him well, who are struggling with faith, who are on the fringes of church, or maybe friends and co-workers or family, and I'm going to do it with them. I'm going to make a commitment of the will to share the love and grace of Christ with them. And it's one of the easiest ways to begin those conversations. But the question is, if God is God and he commanded you to do it, do you love him? And will you do it? If you love him, go take care of my sheep. If you love me, go take care of my sheep. Amen? So we're going to worship right now. If you would like to be baptized, I'll be over here. If not, I would like everyone after worship to join me outside. We have some amazing baptisms today. And we will be celebrating those together. And I'd love for you to stay and join us. And then we have a picnic afterwards where we can be together. Amen? Let's worship.
while we were worshiping, I felt just a, t- t- a nudging in my spirit to just share this with you. I feel like you need to hear this. Um, when I say things like this, is God, God, do you love him? Are you committed to him? It, it can kind of heap. I know because I hear it from you. It can kind of heap this like, oh, crap. Like, I don't. I wish I did. I just need you to hear this. And I'm not saying this happily. As I worship today about giving my whole self to God, take everything, it was a conviction for me. God is not God of my life. I'm a pastor and I'm lazy. I got so, not lazy in the sense of work. I got so much work to keep me busy, I love being busy. I got so many things to think about and do that I love staying busy. And you know what I don't have time for is to make God God. To just be in his presence, to read his word, to pray for more than a few minutes. And so the conviction is, is this man who I profess with my mouth, this God who has loved me and really has met me miraculously in my life, has given his full self to me when I did not deserve it, and I barely got time for him outside of my work. And so my challenge to you is not to heap this burden upon you. It's to say, you know what? Here's what I do with that. What I, what I preached is still true. It's this. It's that I have a definition of love. And I don't feel guilt as in, oh, I'm so bad. It draws me back. I know what I'm supposed to do as I need to be present and I need to go listen to him and I need to be in his presence. Why? Because he loves me. Because he has loved me so greatly, he deserves it and I want him to have that. And so even when God is not God, I know he should be. And it draws me back and it challenges me to go, do you love me more than these? And when I can say, no, Father, I don't, draws me back to the place where his love is the greatest, where his presence is the greatest. And that's all I'm saying to you. If you know you have not loved him more than these, don't let it heap on you guilt, but get to a place where you go, I want to love you the way you've loved me and I'm coming back. Amen? Will you come join us for baptisms outside? It's an exciting time we get to celebrate new life in Christ and then hang out with us afterwards. I'll see you out there. Thank you.